So without any further ado, I don't want to spoil any biographic introduction. I'm going to let the guests present themselves. We have first Ken. Second, Ruben. And last but not least, Robert. So I, I hope I didn't butcher any names. I'm Good. Italian, I might have an accent, I don't know about that. So first let's start. Can you give a brief introduction about yourself? Let's start from left to right. Okay. Oh my gosh, which side is that? It's my right. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I guess I, I um, have been working on Apache Beam and like Cloud Dataflow for eight and a half years. Um, I'm the PMC chair, so which means that I write a report to the board of the foundation. It doesn't mean I'm other than do that. Do today, I think. Do today. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, the rest of the PMC and everybody on the dev list are welcome to contribute please. Um, but yeah, so that's, you know, it's not not actually like a boss position amongst the PMC, just like the person who does the paperwork. Um, and yeah, before Google, I did like analytics for some startups and not quite nonprofits. So there's benefit corp, kind of sort of that area. Um, so I was really excited. Like when I came here, I also, so I have a PhD in programming languages. So I was like really excited to work on something that's kind of like programming languages and addresses all the pain that I had like encountered, like in my life trying to build analytic systems where I did like Lambda architecture with whatever RabbitMQ and like weird bespoke batch systems. It was awful. Um, so did, yeah, anyhow, Beam is like, Mwah! and I love open source. <laughs> so, okay, there we go. How about you, Revan? Um, yeah, so I've been working on Beam Dataflow and predecessors to it for about 15, 16 years. Uh, before before Dataflow, we had a system called uh, Millwheel, which we published a paper on in, two, I think it was 2010, wasn't it? Something thereabouts. 2014, uh, I think. That was Millwheel? Oh, no, oh, sorry, that sorry, was sorry. The Dataflow no, paper. Yeah, that was the Dataflow paper. Yeah. Um, Millwheel was 2000. And that was, that was an earlier streaming system where a lot of the concepts in Beam, like like watermark, state, timers, a lot of those concepts originated there in Millwheel. Um, and then we moved on to build Dataflow. Um, and then Beam came out of Dataflow when we took the Dataflow API and sort of separated it from Dataflow and open sourced it as Apache Beam. Um, okay. Before that, I was you know, working on completely different things. I was working on um, storage systems at Microsoft for a few years. Um, Wow, that's definitely a unique path. Now, if my math is correct, I'd say that if Dataflow Beam or the predecessor were kids, you would have like a teenager son, more or less? Yeah, pretty much. Okay, and what about you, Robert? Yeah, so I've uh, um, been working on Beam again since before Beam existed. Um, I started Google working on this thing called Flume that was kind of the predecessor to Beam internally. Actually. Uh, Flume and Millwheel merged together to make uh, Beam and Dataflow. So we've got kind yeah. of two ancestors here. Yeah, we took, Flu we took Flume, Millwheel, also a bit of MapReduce, hmm. and a bit of other systems and kind of like merged them together to create Dataflow. Yeah, yeah. So I've uh, so been working on that for you know over a decade now. And uh, before that, I was actually a um, mathematician, pure mathematics. Don't get to use it, but I still find it beautiful, so. Okay, that, that's interesting. So. My understanding is more or less everyone here is coming from at a certain time from academia. And maybe the hat that you had at Google when you joined was software engineer, but the reality is that I don't think you were that far away from a researcher at Google. Or at least when you started, it felt like that way, I'd say. So how did your research at Google led to like the development of Apache Beam? Like try to bring us in a really short, but yet like, uh, <laughs> as detailed as possible history of what led to the creation of Apache Beam. I think we should start on the opposite side. Sure, so. yeah. <laughs> so I think um, kind of a lot of it is uh, finding, so, so in math what you do is, you know, you have all these diverse problems and then you find out like what problem could I solve that would like solve all of these? 
And I think that's one key carryover that, that we've you know, taken with Beam is you see, you know, every, everyone has like their unique problem they're trying to do, whether they be like, you know, we had a lot of great talks yesterday, you know, IoT sensors or, you know, financial transactions um, and being able to boil that down and say, OK, what is like the really crux of the issue that we're trying to solve here? And if we can make a tool that can do that, then you can, you know, use it in all these various situations. And that's something more useful than just kind of solving each one and as a one off bespoke system. Yeah, I agree. And I think part of the challenge we often faced was this balancing act where we're, you know, we're searching in that sort of math sense for what is the real thing that would be the, the most general, the most abstract. And sometimes you, you're not convinced you found it. And you, you have to do this balancing act of, do we wait indefinitely until we find the one true answer? Or do we say, okay, this is what we have um, and we're going with this and we may regret it later. And there was a lot of playing that balancing act and I think sometimes we've regretted on both sides. Sometimes we've put things out there that we look back on three years later and we said, oh, we, we wish we had waited, we wish we hadn't done that. But then there were times that we waited too long and we looked back and said, you know what, we wish we had just put something out there. And you know, it's the benefit of hindsight. It's, I think those, those balancing acts are really hard to get right in the moment you're trying to get them right. I guess um, I came in somewhat later, right? So I, I didn't research the original systems, but sort of more like as Beam gained its unified model, I was involved in sort of the, the early development of that. Um, and something I'll emphasize, which is very, it's related, um, and, and it's not just because you primed us with the word research, but I think something that we, have done differently that has really led to it being the way it is, is, is the sort of an uncompromising approach to correctness. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think that there's a lot of systems, especially at high scale, um, they sort of, they prize getting something that kind of mostly works over sort of solving a problem in a way that's durable. Um, and I think that in Beam, we've really taken the approach of like, you're going to have the right answer. Um, and in the event that there's something that's approximate about it, that's going to be well described. Um, and that's, that's to me what led to like beam existing as opposed to, you know, that's, I don't know, I don't want to beat up on any past systems that are all very, very useful, but like, I will, I'll say, I'll just say like storm, right? Like everybody knew storm is going <laughs> to just like run stuff. Uh, right. And it's up to you to figure out how to make it correct. Um, and, and with Beam, we really, really wanted correctness to be something that the user did not have to solve, like we solve it for you. And this is, I think this was a little unusual when we first came out with Beam. Um, it was, people just assumed that if you're running a streaming system, you would not get precise answers out of it. I mean, how many people here remember the Lambda architecture? Oh yeah, I Which did. was, I did. a lot of people remember <laughs> the Lambda architecture, which was a well-publicized pattern. But the whole point of the Lambda architecture was based, predicated on this assumption that your streaming system would give you incorrect data. So you had to rerun a batch system at the end of the day and use a streaming system to get, you know, just sort of good enough data. So the idea that we, you, that you, we could give you a system that would run streaming, run low latency and also give you precise data was strange. I mean, now it's no longer strange. There are other systems that, you know, you can run Apache Flink as well and get exactly one's data you can run spark streaming and get exactly one's data. This was in 2015 or so. Hmm. This was kind of a stranger idea for a lot of people. Hmm. I wonder, like continuing on this research at Google, like how, how was it born? Like a 20% project, like uh, following up another task? Was it like, no, I like this project, I'm gonna do it full time and I'm gonna take the risk. How did it work? How far back are we going to like yeah. Flume and Mill yeah, or I mean, to data flow? Flume and Mill wheel were, you know, so, you, you can talk about Millwood. It was like an actual project. So, you know, Craig Chambers, he's, you know, another researcher. He was a professor at University of Washington, uh, came into Google, um, did some other stuff, and then started, you know, the Flume project, as he said, I have a better way to do MapReduces. Um, and, uh, but, you know, there was a time when it was like, you know, we thought it was going to get canceled, you know? And it's like, you know, <laughs> oh, the whole idea is just going to get scrapped. MapReduce is good enough for anyone. Um, so. <laughs> Yeah, and you know, you, you, when you start something out, even if it was you know a full-time project, and there was a team of like, you know, four people, you know, trying to build the system out, trying to find some users, trying to just you know validate that this is a useful system and sell people on it, um, 
you know, it really kind of like, you know, took a while for the idea to, to click. And then kind of once it took off, then it was more pragmatic. And, you know, then you have all of a sudden have more users than you know what to do with. And yeah. you're, you know, you're like, how do I how do I support everyone? How do I make it do everything that's, that's being asked? And I think that kind of validates it from like being a research idea to being something really useful. Yeah. Did you have any chance of getting code review by Jeff Dean or something at the first submissions when you were trying to improve MapReduce? <laughs> no, my, my Dean number is two. Okay. So. <laughs> but uh, Google has this idea of readability review. So in every programming language at Google, um, when you first join, somebody has to, uh, you, have to say, you have to apply for readability review and somebody who's a reader in that language has to approve and say, okay, you're good in that language. So when I first joined Google, I applied for readability in several languages. One of them was Python. And I get a response saying, your randomly assigned readability reviewer for Python is Guido Van Rossum. <laughs> <laughs> And it was an interesting review because at one point he told me to change something in my code. And I went and read our style guide and, guide and said, I don't get it. I don't see anything in the style guide. Why I shouldn't use this function? And the answer was like, I don't want you to use that because I want to remove that function in the next version of Python. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. Yes, uh, for uh, like Guido and Rossum was the author and creator of Python and also worked at Google. So I don't know if everyone was aware of this, but this is kind of like a really interesting fact. And I wonder, like, when you came up with the idea or like joined the team at a point where like Beam was still like a really kind of like pioneeristic project, I'd say, like, did you expect the project to grow up in such like a nice community one day sitting in New York and hosting a panel about founders and friends? I don't know, like we, we had some issues naming the, the <laughs> session, but we ended up with founders. I hope you're going to enjoy. Yeah, um, I mean, no. I mean, not no. Like, this is a dream come true kind of thing, right? It's like we we did have, we started from like a great place in terms of like open source community because it was like a, a collaboration between someone who, you know, wrote Flink Runner, someone else wrote the Spark Runner because um, it came from like the, the Dataflow SDK, which had some hooks for like plugging in other engines. Um, and people that we didn't know basically just wrote these things, um, and and so we we, we had hopes because we were like, okay, we're we're putting all these open source projects together, dumping them in a repo, getting the foundations like sort of approval uh, to start incubating. Um, but you know, I guess I you never you can never be like, oh yes, this will definitely grow into a like an open source project with like you know hundreds of contributors that has like a conference where we all get together and stuff. That seems. Okay, and what about you guys? I mean, I think yes and no. I think we definitely came in hoping that Beam would grow and that it wouldn't be a completely niche project. But you, like, like Ken said, you, when you put something new out there, you never know. Like, we were convinced that this was better than what was out there before, and it was an advance over the state of the art. But you just never know if the you know, if people will jump on it or people will be like, yeah, it's, I don't know, it's a little complicated. I don't quite get it. Especially the, the B model wasn't always the simplest model uh, to get your head around. So I, I think I'm definitely happy that it's grown to the point where it's grown today. Okay. And like, I mean, when Beam was first released, I suppose it was like, I mean, the model was still there, but I suppose it's pretty different from what it is today. What like what changed the most, and what is like the feature that you contributed to that you're most proud of? Feel like okay, yeah, I'll, I'll take this. <laughs> um, so I think, uh, well, what, one thing I'm I'm glad of is like the core model has not you know significantly deviated, um, which is kind of nice to see that like you know what, what what was what went out there at least you know it kind of you know it had legs, um, but definitely a lot of uh, I think. Um, there's like uh, some of the things that have been added is uh, just the portability and cross language story, I think has been huge. Um, you know, when like was mentioned, you know, we, we started Beam and we said, oh, we have like, you know, a Flink runner and a Spark runner. Um, but it was kind of like a fake portability story in the sense that we kind of had those. Um, and so I think, you know, that's, that's one of the things I, I think has really grown is because kind of this idea that you don't have to be locked into a language, you don't have to be locked into a runner. And now that, um, you know, since, since the founding, that's been reified 
in you know a set of protocols and, and you know specifications that really allow this this mix and match oper interoperability where we've seen like in a lot of talks you know this cross language if I just want to like grab something that's already written in Java and just use it as is in my Python pipeline or you know I'm making a new SDK and I can you know just just borrow this whole suite of things instead of saying oh well here's like the the nine sources that I have to implement by hand before I have anything useful so I think that that's something that really needs to come out one thing I'm proud that we added was the schema support because the original beam model the the whole concept was like user data is completely opaque it's just every data is a blob users can write a coder or use a built-in coder to tell us how to turn their blob into bytes which is just another blob and the schema support added this concept which was not an innovation it's something that clearly SQL databases have had for decades and decades that you 90% of the time, there is structure to data. Data is usually made up of fields, and fields often have specific types. And if you expose that structure, you can, pr you can provide ways that are not only easier for users, instead of having to write complicated code, they can just say, you know, sum by field foo, like you would do in SQL. Um, but also a lot, gives a lot more opportunities to optimize things. And so adding that support, which we did, what, about four years ago i'm losing track of time now it's maybe five process. years ago it's an ongoing <laughs> process but that was that's one thing that uh, also changed beam from the original beam model okay i, I have a questions for ken no pressure okay yeah sure yeah. what advice hmm? would you give to someone who is interested in contributing to apache beam do it. Um, <laughs> well, specifically, uh, don't hesitate, I guess. Um, we're very nice. And if there you, whatever reason you think should be in the way of your con contribution, um, it's probably not really. Like, it's, it's great. You can, you know, um, that's the whole thing, right? There is a long contribution guide. Um, I'm going to say, like, you don't have to read it. You don't have to follow what it suggests. Like, if you just make contact and open a pull request, that's like the start of our relationship right there. Okay. I, I heard stories about like long lasting pull requests. Oh my gosh. If that starts <laughs> happening, just ping me. Yeah. I will step in. Okay. That should not happen, right? That's like you have one job as a code reviewer. <laughs> well, you have two jobs, but like job one, be nice, be welcoming. Uh, job two, make sure the code will not ruin anybody's day later. And I'd say sometimes code reviewers the code reviewers lose track or forget that they're reviewing a PR. So they just ping them and say, hey, you know, them, give them a friendly ping and said, hey, do you still remember you're reviewing my PR? And <laughs> half the time they'll probably say, oh shoot, I forgot about that. Let me look at that again. Because yeah. you know, yeah. everybody's busy. Right. I want to add something which is also, a, I'm jumping back to a previous question which is related to this, which is like, if you look at our con contributions, um, in the beginning, we thought maybe it'd be a few companies collaborating with big teams each building. But what we actually have is we have hundreds and hundreds of people that have contributed once, right? So like the other thing is like, you are in very good company if you have like one thing you just did and you want to contribute it, right? That's the vast majority of our contributors. Okay. I, I wonder, this is like uh, out of curiosity. Are there any Beam contributors who were Beam contributors and then join your team at Google? Yeah. yeah, the answer is yes. I was just trying yeah, to think I, of naming names. You know, there are people who have like, used Beam yeah. before and then, then end up joining, yeah. Yeah. Ah, okay. Okay, and uh, this is the last Beam, strictly Beam-related question, is like, and it's a little bit open-ended, but what are your hopes and dreams for Apache Beam, for the future of Apache Beam? I, I hope like I hope it keeps growing. Like you know, it gets <laughs> it's more more use, more you know, interesting uh, uh, cases. Be you know, continues to be helpful to people. Um, we've got I think uh, you know, schemas was mentioned, portability was mentioned. There's a lot of projects that are like you know already useful, but like have not yet you know reached their full potential. Um, so I think there's you know just you know continues to to grow and flourish and okay. make people's lives easier. Okay. Well, personally, I'm a big fan of the run inference part because, like that, I, f I find it kind of unique to Beam. But uh, maybe it's me being ignorant. So I'm really, really happy to be discovering Beam at this time. Let's put it this way. So now let's. I mean, let's ask 
questions that are a little bit not strictly beam, related, beam focused. I wanted to insert a question about cryptocurrencies, but they're like, so 2022. <laughs> and now in 2023, we have generative AI. So now with ChatGPT and BART, I'm adding both because I work for Google, so I'm biased. But uh, have you ever tried to create any kind of like Beam pipeline? Yeah. And were you able to actually make one that run and work properly? Uh, I'm close. Just close. So I don't care if it runs. It's great for being like, what should this code generally look like? If you're like, I don't really know how to get started, boom. Like, you know, I don't think I would trust these. I, I, you know, I, I'm not gonna have opinions about LLMs for other things, but optimistically, it like is great for lowering the barrier to entry. Yeah, I definitely asked um, LLMs to create uh, beam pipelines for me. And yeah, they, they'll come close. Sometimes they'll cut, you know, you'll get things with like stupid mistakes in them that will just never work but are not that far off of working. But they like look the way. They look the way of these. Yeah. I've mm -hmm. also just taken, given it Spark programs and said, hey, can you convert this Spark program to Beam? Can you convert this Beam program to Spark? And it is a surprisingly good job at giving the equivalent Beam version of Spark or Spark version of Beam. Again, like sometimes it'll, you know, they'll, it'll, just, you know, like put in a less than instead of a greater than or silly mistakes that will make the whole thing not work. But if you actually understand what it's outputting, it's pretty easy to scan it and be like, oh, I don't want to fix this. And you just saved me 15 minutes of typing boilerplate code. Right. Yeah. Or it'll just like put two numbers into a tuple and be like, there's the hash function. <laughs> like that's a tuple. Yeah, <laughs> but exactly. It doesn't matter, you know, because you, it eliminates the blank slate. Yeah, I, I find it, it takes a surprisingly good stab at it. it you know, it, the, the one thing I noticed is kind of like the more you get off the trodden path, mm. um, kind of the, the, the more it kind of, it'll still take a stab at it, but kind of like, you know, a much more blind stab at. So, you know, word, word count, it could produce word count all day. <laughs> yeah. um, but, uh, but I, you know, they're, they're only going to get better. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, what, what it can do today is pretty impressive and, you know, what it could do tomorrow is probably get you know those less than greater than science right and um, more complex pipelines. And I, th I I assume the more the community that grows and more the internet and the training set essentially gets filled with more examples of Beam code, the better these models will get. I wonder like are these where these pipeline all like streaming or also batch and like were there any differences in the quality of the code that the bot was able to generate. That's the great thing about Beam. They're both, right? Yeah. <laughs> I was my favorite as I, I always be like, okay, give me a read from a pub sub topic, enrich it with from data, you read from files, something like that, right? And it looked reasonable, you know, it looked like word count, okay. but, but it, it, you know, but it had the right things in it. Yeah, it would get most of the imports right. Right. But like anybody who's thinking of doing this, if there is a turnkey transform we provide that does the work, use that because then when a bug is fixed, you'll get the bug fix. Yeah. Like, don't write your whole pipeline this way if it's you know something that can be shipped. Okay, so uh, throughout the conference we handed over books. So I do think that as a data practitioner, several people here have read several data books. Personally, I read Streaming Systems, which was really one of my favorite books. So congrats, Riven. Uh, and I have to say, like. A lot of people usually search inspiration in finding new books. And if one randomly goes over O'Reilly, the list is quite long. Would you have any recommendation outside of that book that I personally recommend from beginners to experts? I do think that you're going to get great value out of it. Any data book that you would recommend either from O'Reilly or outside of O'Reilly? If you don't recommend those and you like fiction, that's fine as well. But I was gonna say, <laughs> yeah. most of my favorite data books are probably the ones from 40 years ago. <laughs> like your books on database systems by Cod and a lot of those original like foundational books. And I think at the, on the one hand, some of that early foundational stuff feels, you know, a distance from the problems we're solving today. But like with a lot of mathematical stuff, you find that a lot of that is still the foundation of the way we think about data. Yeah. And I, I always think it's important to have a very foundational understanding of things before you, you know, build on top of that. Okay. Then like, if you don't have any data book, any interesting read that you would suggest for the audience? 
I'm going to switch. Any interest in movies you've seen so far? No, I was going to say, I was like, if you like academic papers, but I don't know. Yeah, papers, yeah. I, yeah. Mean, I, I think the papers um, on like, you know, Streambox and all the NIAD papers are really inspiring and really relevant. Uh, just to name two off the top of my head. Okay. Then I have an easier question, I hope. An easier question. So when you're not committing or contributing to Apache Beam, what do you do? Any hobbies? <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, no, I've got this guitar playing. I, yeah, I, I play and I'm starting to build guitars. I know, I, yeah, I, I had been my, myself a fretless guitar, which I play every day, but um, yeah. Okay. I'm in a band. We play cool 90s covers, <laughs> in case you really miss the early 90s. Okay, so we, we have a future rock star. <laughs> then uh, what about you, Ruben? Um, I say traditionally, my two biggest hobbies have been uh, swing dancing and rock climbing. Although the past couple of years, it's running after a three-year-old. <laughs> okay, definitely more challenging. Yeah, so I'm, I'm in the same boat. I got five kids. And that's that's pretty all-encompassing hobby. You've got, you know... Uh, <laughs> How did it scale? What? Oh, How yeah, well, I, I'm parallel processing. So I got uh, twin girls. Twin boys, and then I had a straggler, you know. The straggler. So. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but yeah, that, that keeps me busy. I've got you know they, you know we like camping. My boys are in a robotics club, um, just you know stuff like that. So. Okay, then uh, the last question, and then we're gonna switch to audience question. Feel free to ask the most embarrassing question you can to mind. That's not a problem. That's gonna be their problem. <laughs> But uh, the last question is like for the future, if you could decide the next location of the Beam Summit, assuming that we need to have like a Google facility nearby for budget reasons, very likely. But where would you be, uh, like? Where would you like to see the next Beam Summit? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, clearly New York. Um, I would love to go back to London. We did some events in London before the pandemic. It would be nice to go back there. Okay. I always feel conflicted because like, if you, if you do it in Hawaii, I'm not going to come to the summit talks. <laughs> <laughs> we have an office in the Hawaii? No, no. Well, oh, okay. <laughs> that was news to me. That was a dream. We have a year to build the Google office in Hawaii. <laughs> you, only, you just need one desk and it's a Google office. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And what about you, Robert? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it would be nice, you know, like to alternate like Europe because you get you can get a different crowd because, yeah. um, you know, there are, there are definitely, you know, people here from all over the world, but uh, um, it's a lot easier to go to a summit that's like, you know, a two hour flight away than, you know, 10 or 20 hour flight away. That's okay. So thank you again. Any question from the audience? Uh, well, since guys, you're all already here. Uh, what do you think about Beam 3.0? <laughs> <laughs> well, what do you think it should be there? The what? Beam 3.0. You know, I guess like the question of like how to actually evolve Beam in a way where we have to make changes that would cause someone to have to like, you know, adjust the pipeline that's been running for like five years it's it's tough to make those kinds of calls uh, <laughs> yeah there's there was no, python 3.0 i do have opinion i think like schemas should be the default everywhere right and like we have we've i've seen two different mentions in talks at this summit about like the default like just use the pickle coder or the java serializable coder right like that was a mistake but now we have data encoded that way so we don't have a choice of just like switching that without breaking a bunch of people um yeah, we do have years of sort of experience of all the cross and everything that was wrong with Beam, you know, <laughs> and things that we can't really change completely because, you know, it's part of Beam. Um, so, yeah, making schemas a default, say everything is a schema, maybe the windowing triggering API, which has proved to be very confusing to a lot of users. We had a lot of ideas of here's a better way of doing triggering. And it was never done partially because no one ever had time to do it, but partially because it would, it, we can't get rid of the old triggering API. So now you would just have yet another triggering API that we'd say, this one is better, but all the examples on the internet use this old one. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, so there are a lot of things like that where you have the opportunity to clean things up, make things you know simpler, more understandable, more expressive, without having to worry about uh, about you know compatibility with the old thing. Um, practically, I, I mean, I don't know. Yeah, do you it, think being three point is something in the card soon, or do you think it's? I think it's also hard because if you do a radical change, then you're going to live with the two, being 2.0 and being yeah. 3.0 simultaneously. Mm -hmm. And this is almost a worse position to be in. Um, so, you know, I think there's, there's you know, being 1.0 to 2.0 was because, or I guess it was really 0.x to 2.0. Yeah. Um, was, you know, we had like this nested system and then we kind of like finally figured out what we're really going to do. Um, but, uh, we, you know, breaking change is different when you have, you know, thousands of users than we have tens of users. And I think it's a different viewpoint sometimes. For, there's the pure OSS viewpoint and there's a the support viewpoint. So from the pure Beam community, you know, we can, the Beam community can decide how much you support the users who come and ask questions about the old version of Beam versus, um, mm -hmm. you know, how much you say, just rewrite your code to the new version of Beam. We also wear another hat in that we also work for Google and the Dataflow team. So we have customers of Dataflow who come for support and are paying customers. And then you're in a harder position to just say, hey, go rewrite, you, you have 50,000 lines of code, just please rewrite it all because we don't want to support this other thing starting tomorrow. Uh, people aren't very happy to hear that. But maybe if, you know, ChatGPT or Bard is good enough. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> yeah, we just provide an LLM to bugly trans. <laughs> yeah, here's a translation utility. I mean, there, there are large open source projects where their community has decided they value improvements over compatibility. I don't think this is that kind of compute like community really, but like that's a, that's a decision that could be made. But I think the question when you mentioned being through, I know there's like what should be in it. Like this is just like oh yeah, what are your dreams for things that you could never do? Um, but then there's also like how do we try to bring that, you know, bring that to people right and like. For starters, building it all behind a flag is not, you know, we could do that. And then you're still living with Beam 2.0 and 3.0 at the same time. But you can just like, you pass the Beam 3 flag and then it does the things like choose good coders or enable, you know, disable the bad triggers or enable the good triggers, that, that kind of stuff. You stick that behind a flag and eventually like, that's what you release. Yeah, actually, uh, actually, my question was uh, um, caused by this because uh, we have a lot of uh, deprecated and legacy stuff that sometimes we drop it, sometimes we just forget about it forever. <laughs> so uh, yeah. it causes, of course, breaking changes. So, and this is why actually, usually the next major version of the product, it's for that. So you start to work on this uh, in parallel, of course, because it's not easy just switch to real next major version just as a next release. Uh, but you start and work on this and you bring like a, only the best things or keep only the things that yeah. up to date in, in this branch. Of course, it's double work uh, for us as uh, developers. But I'm a little bit wondering because, well, since I'm quite a long on the project, but we really re rare um, talking about this. I mean, that uh, we're talking about some legacy stuff, some annotations that's uh, a little bit useless for now but we are not talking about what we will do kind of to o overcome this and maybe the next major version is a good thing for that that was uh, a reason for my question yeah. yeah yeah i think there is there is a lot of deprecated stuff you know we're gonna get rid of reshuffle right <laughs> <laughs> someday maybe well really we're just gonna rename it and then rename will be deprecated but uh um we already did it's called re yeah it's true. redistributed <laughs> i think it's like in the repo um, but I think a lot of a lot of what we can do, we can also do. We found, you know, kind of evolutionarily, um, and I think it might be an interesting idea to, you know, um, take some of these deprecated things that we haven't wanted to remove, and make it so that they throw an error if you don't, you know, pass a flag that says use deprecated stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and then after a while of doing that, we can actually get rid of it and clean things up. Um, but you know, at a, at a slower cadence, then you have to like, you know, decide: Am I living in the old world or the new world? Um, more like, you know, how can I get from the old world to new world, more of a continuum. Um, but then there are things like we just removed the JRH in January, um, where, you know, portability, 
Um, we're, we're slowly moving to that world and getting rid of the old world at the same time, because if you don't get rid of the old things, um, you're just adding work for yourself. Yeah. Um, I want to just add context for the audience that this is Alexei. He's on the PMC asking other members of you. So <laughs> this is a decision you. he gets to make with us. Okay. Any other question? Uh, so um, if I'm correct, then first Kubernetes was open source, then TensorFlow was open source, and then uh, Beam came to life a year later. So I think it was 14, 15, 16. Has it been easier to open source the Dataflow SDK uh, than the previous projects? Because uh, it seems that it, there was a lot of discussions uh, according to um, yeah uh, sources that uh, when Kubernetes was open source, that there was a discussion of do we really want to give this out? And when I first saw um, the Dataflow SDK, when it wasn't Apache Beam, I was like, that's super clever how this stuff is done. Um, so um, were there similar discussions when uh, Beam was open sourced or has it been a smooth um, yeah, ride to, to start this open source project? Do you mean internal to Google? Yeah. I don't think, I don't remember that there was much. So the Dataflow SDK was open sourced from the beginning, even before Beam. So I don't, I don't think there was any pushback on open sourcing that. But at the time it was, originally there was, as Robert said, that we didn't have any other runners and then we kind of had a fake uh, Spark runner. So it wasn't originally something that was very useful without Dataflow. Right. It wasn't until later with Bean that other runners were created that it became an actual useful thing. It was originally just you still have to use Google system, but here's an open source SDK for how to use right. it. Well, it yeah. wasn't, it's not like you could have contributed to it meaningfully when it was the Dataflow SDK. It was just like, we built it internally, we threw it over the wall and it was, you know, largely a way of saying like, we're gonna run this code on your VMs, on your data, and like, you can know what it is. Yeah, I think the fact that it was like a fat client that we had to give to users anyway, yeah. made it so that, you know, when you said open sourcing, it's like, there wasn't anything that we were releasing. I mean, you, there was, you know, we were kind of relinquishing control by starting an Apache, you know, separate project, but it wasn't like we had this, you know, code base that we said, do we want to expose it? So that, um, from a technical standpoint, made it a lot easier. And, you know, then like, you know, once we wanted to do it, there was an argument about like, you know, are we revealing any trade secrets? Well, it's already out there. We're just, you know, yeah. making it more clear that this is going to be an open source community, not just, you know, a pile of code on GitHub. There was some process making sure that we didn't accidentally release some piece of Google code that was considered to be trade secret. Uh, not just with the SDK that we released, we also released um, binaries that we would put on the Dataflow VMs. And we had to make sure when we built those binaries, we didn't link in any part of Google code that was like a secret of how Google search works or something, which is surprisingly easy to do because Google has a big mono repo that everything's linked into. So there, were there, a couple there was surprises. There. I think like fingerprint eleven or whatever um, was this you know big thing where they didn't want to release it, and then it it turned out someone had accidentally leaked the code like a year before, and so that whole thing became null and void. So that that was a Anytime. hash function Anytime. that was commonly used at Google, yeah. and that was yeah that was an escalation because the security team was afraid that releasing Google's a commonly used hash function would be a secu uh, security vector against uh, for, against Google. And then that ended up being fine. But yeah, there were a few escalations, but for the most part, it wasn't too bad. There weren't any philosophical objections. Everyone was pretty on board with this. This is the right thing to do. Let's, let's give it to the community. And there were discussions of, at the time of open sourcing, all the internal to data flow as well. And we finally decided that that just didn't make as much sense for a number of reasons. But, you know, the internals of data flow are very, very specifically authored to Google's tech stack and running on Google's infrastructure. So a lot of it wouldn't even be as useful to the general public as it is to us. Yeah. Okay. Uh, oh, so you mentioned that it's probably schema, unforcing um, schema is better for the future since the majority of the data is as actually as a structure. So I'm curious to hear about the history context behind why it was like schema less in the first place. You should, talk, you should talk about the internal history, I feel like. So why we started with just... Um, just like binary blobs as elements. 
Yeah, I, and I think some of that is because that was the history of, it came out of the history of some of our systems at Google. MapReduce and Flume both just said elements are blobs and user writes code to interpret those elements. Well, and internally, everything's a proto. Yeah, so yeah. it was, it was it structured, but schema. we weren't exposing that. Okay. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. At, at Google, ninety-five percent of the time, it's your blob is really a protocol buffer that has that had structure. Right. Um, and there were systems. So Dremel, which was an internal version of what became BigQuery, of course, did understand protos and let people write SQL expressions over them. But um, historically, MapReduce and Flume just, you know, took this philosophy that it's a system for user writing custom code, so the user can just write the code to access their proto. I think, I mean, I think there's also just an aspect of like, we didn't know what users data was going to look like because we invented like Beam has its own concept of row with its own encoding for better or for worse. And like going out the gates with something like we've got our own row with its own encoding. Uh, I feel like that's a bit presumptuous almost like when we were just moving from Beam into data flow. And one of the things we did with the schema support in Beam is we tried to not move too far away from that. So you can take your object, you know, if you have a POJO or a, you know, or a Java Bean, I'm talking about the Java API right now, or an Avro message, and keep it as an Avro message and keep it as a keep it or keep it as a Java Bean, but still have a schema attached to it. And Beam is very smart about knowing that. You know, oh, you want to access field username? That's this getter on the Java bean. So we don't force users to convert everything to a row object just to use schemas. Right. That's that's the actual the actual answer is that it can't. It started as like you're a Java programmer. You just want your Java objects to like flow through your pipeline and not even really know their data. That's that's actually and the origin story of that. Yeah. Frankly, there's no Java standard for schema data. There's yeah. you know a dozen of them that that all meet different needs and fall in different spaces. So. Yes, second row. That's the second. So I guess this is a it's kind of sideways to Beam 3.0, which is more of what are things that you wish you had done for Beam 2.0? What are the the things that are like pain points or decisions that you know in retrospect didn't turn out as well as planned? I could, I mean, I can name a list. Triggers, I think, were too complicated. Side inputs, I would probably rethink how side inputs work. They... Triggered side inputs, the worst thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I wish schemas had been part of Beam 2.0 from the start instead of like put, you know, putting it on top because you know that least implementation difficulties. We kind of had to layer it on top of coders, um, and also it means that. For all that we think schemas are a much simpler, more understandable way of writing code, the average user of uh, so many examples on the internet just show the old way of parse your message using a coder that people are sometimes don't figure out that schemas are there. Okay, do we have any other question? Um, okay. So I'm curious, uh, because Beam has so many different runners, like uh, Flink runners, Spark runners. So how do you ensure that the Beam is uh, going with the same pace with other other runners so that when they upgrade their versions that we can keep up with that? I mean, I guess the short answer is that we don't. Um, we <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm too blunt. Um, I think each runner has like, it will keep up with sort of proportional to how much interest people have in the runner. Um, the We do try not to make like wild changes that would require runners to like implement huge amounts of stuff. Um, that's why, I mean, that's kind of why like a number of runners still like more or less work, right? Because we have, we've actually had even more than like there's the, you just named like the, the big ones that, um, but there's a whole bunch more that people have written, right? Um, yeah. Anyhow, that's I guess the yeah the real thing is like I, I I think about this a lot is in the in the open source you're gonna have people come in for like a little while and then maybe they they go to something else or maybe the different companies and team sizes and usage ebbs and flows with different runners um, and we just have to I mean I'll I'll leave out technical details but but generally just like allow things to be in whatever state they're in and and not 
consider them to be like broken. If they have a certain set of features, then that's the features they support and always try to, you know, catch, be able to analyze what the user is doing and say like, oh yeah, I can run that or I can't run that and just communicate clearly what the capabilities are. And I think the thing is each runner kind of has its community and, you know, mm -hmm. the community is responsible. The people who use it are responsible for updating it and in the best position to see if it works. And then also uh, with the portability story, we, we take the beam pipeline, we break it down as to its primitives. And as long as the runner supports those primitives, which are relatively slowly changing compared to the rest of the things, um, it should just work. Um, so it's kind of like, you know, saying, well, you know, you have the, the JVM and, you know, the language continues to evolve, but as long as you compile the bytecode, um, you don't have to worry about it working. And Beam has gotten ahead of runners before. So one example was um, an ordered state object was added to Beam where you can store, store elements and Beam would keep them ordered. And the Flink runner did not have an efficient way of implementing it. And for a while there was a poll where some Flink contributors spent some time looking at ways of adding it to Flink. I think, I think this never actually happened in Flink. So the Flink implementation is probably still some inefficient thing where it just stores it in a list and then sorts the list when you read it. Uh, but it, di it did create for a while, like there was some interest and there was some discussion on the Flink community about changing Flink itself so it would have the ability to store um, order state. Okay, other questions? Uh, I see two, one up there and one here. There you go. Hello. <laughs> Yeah, you, you mentioned community several times. You mentioned that like uh, maybe initially you thought there might be like uh, several big players come in and uh, and it have has like there are a lot of small contributors contribute once. Then what's your goal for growing the community and what do you think is the ideal way, the best structure of the community? Gosh, I feel like that question was at me. <laughs> Um, yeah, I don't know. I, the truth is, I, th I think that, um, you know, more interested contributors of, I have a different perspective now than I did because I think um, companies, I think users, like the best open source community are our users, um, right? And having big players all investing and building it and they're all selling it, for example, right? I, I don't actually think that model's as good as having like power users like building the stuff that they really need and can, and sort of like they they know how to use the, this project and they know how to contribute to it because um, honestly they're like more invested in it. I feel like companies can be fickle sometimes, but anyhow, I I shouldn't say too much. I, any community is great, um, but my favorite thing is when users convert to contributors. I think there's the community can take on many different shapes, but yeah. kind of one of the important aspects for me is uh, sustainability. And you know, it doesn't matter you know who's contributing as long as there are contributors there. There are people willing to you know say, yeah. this doesn't work for me, or this works, but it could be better. And you know, just say, okay, I'm just going to contribute back. Um, you know, if you if you've written Beam code, you know, eighty percent of the library is Beam code, and so all Beam developers could just you know say, well, this worked for me. This was useful for me. You know, I think it'll be useful for someone else. And then, you know, it could be, you know, people who are employed. It could be people who are doing it for a hobby. Lots of times it's just people who, you know, they, they need to use Beam for something and they see something that could be improved and they improve it. And uh, as long as you have a critical mass of those, I think that's key. I want to, on that note, just sorry for jumping in. Um, you know best what you need, kind of. Like one of the things about that I really love about having a, a million one-time contributors is that tells me that Beam is more effectively meeting users' needs than it possibly could if it weren't open source, right? Because we have, like, having people at a big player think they know what you want and then build it uh, is not even close to as good as if you know what you want and you build it, right? I mean, obviously, you have to do the work then, uh, but but in general, like, the, the project will be much better suited for, for what you're trying to get done um, if it has, like, user contributions. Which was the other okay. question? I, I, I think I remember that there was somebody in the last lanes. Yes. Okay. He just waved his hand. Who? Person of color with white t-shirt. Third seat from the right. Here? No? 
<laughs> I cannot see you. Sorry. <laughs> Somebody. Can you raise your hand if you still want to ask the question? No. Nobody wants to. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So, if we don't have any more questions, I'm going to just ask one last one from me, but out of curiosity. You work with customer, you've seen like internal versions of Apache Beam and like how it is used at Google. How, what is the longest running pipeline <laughs> that you've seen? Maybe running right now, uh, like... It's I mean, there's streaming how pipelines old, that exactly. right, yeah. run for years. Yeah, sometimes run for years. And it's tricky because people can up, we support this update where you can update a streaming pipeline to a new one. So you definitely find pipelines that, you know, the, this one pipeline has been running for a month, but it was just an update of a previous pipeline, which is an update of a previous pipeline, which going back for multiple years. But Including we, the updates. So the original John was, uh, jo uh, job was like spin and then updated, 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 but trace back up to that time. Yeah, That's but awesome. we've also seen pipelines running I mean, I've personally seen pipelines that have been running for over a year without an update. Okay. Um, and we've seen escalations of customers. Something went wrong with the pipeline and it starts off, this has been running for 18 months. Why is it breaking now? And our reaction is like, cool, it ran for 18 months. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or, I mean, surprisingly, there are batch pipelines that like run for a week. Like we had, you know, this with mm. uh, with internally at Google, we, you know, it creates a lot of temporary files and we, you know, we have the system where our file system will automatically delete after, you know, <laughs> three days or five days. And, you know, someone will set their TTL to be like, don't delete this file for like 14 days. And their batch job will run for so long that like all of a sudden the temporary files are deleted out from under them. And you're like, oh, that's, that's a big job. Okay. So, yeah. But there are some very there are some very long lived pipelines out there. Um, it's and occasionally that's a problem because they're running an extremely old version of Apache Beam, an extremely old version of the code, and when there's a problem, like you have to do archaeology to figure out what version of this code from two years ago is being run on this pipeline. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm familiar with customers having these problems, unfortunately. <laughs> but yes, I'm familiar. Yeah. Thank you. And a round of applause for the panelists. Oh, thanks, Federico.